Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to Living and Thriving with Rusty. I'm Rusty. This is Video Land, YouTube um, Land. I don't know what else to call it. It's it's a different world for me. I'm so used to doing a podcast that the YouTube um, it, it's it's been a learning process. I'm really learning a lot fast. I'm super excited to have Jenny Lisk on again. She and I um, hit it off, and she just didn't have enough time to really share her story fully, and I think she's plugging in now. Hi, sweetheart. How are you? Hi, Rusty. Good morning. Good, Good morning. Again. Nice to see you as well. And we had, we didn't even like scratch the surface on the first one, so um, you're in charge. You tell me how you want to start and how you want to do it. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> well, let's see. Did we talk last time about um, some of the things I've learned from my guests about children's grief? Okay. Um, okay, so I have learned so many things. Um, and I think one of the most useful and something that to me was not obvious was this question about being honest with kids about difficult topics, including death, including difficult, um, you know, stigmatized deaths. People don't want to talk about death. They really don't want to talk about suicide and, and drug overdose deaths and some of the things that, you know, become, end up becoming stigmatized. And, but even, even questions like, um, you know, a kid asking, is my, is my other parent going to survive? You know, like, and if you know that they're not going to, how do you handle that question, right? And as a future widowed parent, if you will, as someone who was already single parenting, already seeing where this was going, that they, you know, this was going to not end well, I didn't know how to answer these questions. Like I felt, and it felt so fraught, right? Like if I answer it this way or that way, am I going to mess them up forever, right? And who can even tell me uh, these things? So I had a fascinating discussion um, with a woman named Lauren Schneider, and she's at Our House Grief Support Center in Los Angeles. She's the first person that I heard about this from. And, and what she says really um, well and interestingly is that it's critical to be honest with kids, that the surviving parent be honest with the kids um, for a number of reasons, including the fact that the... Um, that bond of trust that the kids have with the surviving parent is critical, not only in and of itself, also because it sets a pattern for all their future intimate relationships, whether they're close friends, partners, close work colleagues, whatever, um, that, that, that bond of trust. And so what happens is that if the surviving parent um, makes up a story like, you know, your parent had a heart attack, because they think they're too young or something to tell them that it was suicide, for example, um, that eventually the kid will find out that they will probably suspect that something seems off in the story long before they eventually then figure out somebody lets it slip, they read it in the newspaper, they overhear it somehow, or even just eventually the parent sits them down and says, okay, now, now you're quote unquote old enough, I'm going to tell you what really happened. What, what ends up happening is the kid feels like they were lied to all this time and it breaks that bond of trust. And um, I think it also disillusions them too. I mean, they've, they've had this illusion, they've planned their world around this illusion. Yeah, that, I don't know, I, I oof, that would be tough. Yeah. Yeah. But it happens all the time. And you know what? It's it, the best of intentions, right? Parents want to protect their kids. I hear this a lot. They want to protect their kids. The question is, well, what is protective? And it turns out in this case that being protective is not what you might think. You might think it's protecting them from hard information. But being protective is actually telling them the truth and protecting that relationship you have with them that even if it's hard, we can talk about it, you know, even if nobody wants to talk about it, we can um, protecting that relationship between the surviving parent and, and the kid that's based on honesty. And one of the things that I learned too from some of my guests is that um, if a kid is old enough to be asking questions, they're old enough to hear the answers to those questions. Do you think, would you recommend 
um, say it's a drug overdose or, or, you know, drinking and driving or, or just one of those stigmatized deaths, do you recommend going into detail or do you just say, well, depending on the age, of course, um, mommy or daddy made some choices that weren't the right choices and they got into an accident and, you know, I mean, yeah, it depends. And I think, you know, one, one really helpful thing is there, there are grief centers in every community that you can reach out to and say, look, I'm having trouble figuring out how to talk to my kid about this and they will help you figure out, you know, the particulars and how to approach it. And even sometimes you can have a conversation together, you know, with the therapist or social worker or grief counselor from, from the center and the parent and the kids, you know, and they can help facilitate that discussion or they can just give you ideas. But you know, it's, 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 a, it's a really an it depends kind of answer. It depends on the age of the kids. It depends on what they're asking. A lot of times you start giving them some information and then wait to see if they ask more, right? And sometimes like the first bit of information is enough and then they're like, okay. And then they run off and do something else. Sometimes they're like, okay, but now I have this follow-up question. Now I have this follow-up question. Then you keep answering those questions. Um, so it's kind of, it's like a lot of difficult conversations with kids. You know, if, if they start asking about where babies come from, you don't necessarily have to answer every single question in the first discussion. You can kind of gauge like where they're coming from, what they really want to know, what kinds of things they're asking about and kind of go step by step and see, you know, and sometimes, especially with a younger child, you know, answering the first few questions gives them what they want for now. And to answer more would just, they wouldn't be listening anyway or, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever. So it's really, I think, driven by, you know, what they're asking um, and letting them then that kind of lead the, the discussion. That's excellent. Okay. Fair enough. Um, some other things that I've learned, you know, it's, it's, it's really easy to want to fix things, right? Fix if somebody's crying to have them stop crying, if somebody's sad to have them stop being sad, if somebody's worried to look for a silver lining, like to try to, you know, fix quote unquote, what somebody is feeling, which I mean, it's natural, right? It could upset you want to comfort them. Um, it turns out that comforting them is actually, you know, it's more comforting for them to feel heard and seen and understood and listened to like talking them out of whatever they're feeling isn't actually comforting, right? That, and so like the trying to suppress the urge to, to fix, you know, I, and using that in quotes again, um, but to actually listen to them. And, you know, if someone is sad about dad, you know, to agree, yeah, I'm sad too. How is this for you? You know, it's not fair that dad had to die. Yeah, it isn't. You don't have to like, talk them out of thinking it isn't fair you can agree it sucks well you know? I, think, I think one of the things that we kind of captured a little bit last time was um you have to acknowledge within yourself that you're also going through these same questions the questions that are coming out of your kid's mouth are no different than the questions you're asking yourself so you know as an adult as a person that you need to heal and cry and and punch things and take long walks and and whatever um, children don't necessarily have those tools in their, their belt. So you have to be extra strong and teach mm. them how to grieve and cope properly. And, and I'm a fixer, 100%. I am like that mom <laughs> to everybody. If I see you in the grocery store and you're crying, I'm hugging you even if you're a total stranger. That's just me. Uh -huh. um, but I've learned over the years that maybe it's just a hug that's needed, you know? Well that's what I was thinking when you said that, like, like if somebody's crying in the grocery store and you hug them and, and your approach is, I am here, I see you and I'm not running away, then that is helpful. If your approach is, I'm here, I'm hugging you because why aren't you all better now? I just hugged you and this isn't so bad because you should be thinking X, Y, Z instead, right? Then that's not helpful. So it kind of starts out the same way, but it's, you know, how are you approaching it? Where are you taking it? And it's the same thing with kids, right? I mean, they, everybody, including children, needs to feel like, you know, it's validating their, their emotions. 
Um, I think part of parents, though, I think, you know, you don't want your kids to hurt and you don't want them to bleed and you don't want them to cut and you don't want them to bruise and they're right. using. Well, and you, we're coming into this with a background of maybe what you call like typical parenting. Up to this point, we've had like normal kid stuff, right? So if your kid falls and scrapes their knee, you can quote unquote fix that. You can show them where to find the ointment and how to put a bandaid on and how to wash it. And, you know, like you can, so there's a lot of stuff, you know, in our parenting experience to date that is like, we can fix these little things, right? But, but their emotions over losing their parent aren't something you can just fix or take away and trying to take it away actually makes it worse because what happens then is like if if they're sad about losing dad or mom and the other parent tries to do something that ends up feeling invalidating it's not like you tuck them out of how they're oh oh mom you're right i shouldn't feel this way okay thanks for setting me straight that's not what happens what happens is they just stop talking to you about it or maybe even stop talking to anybody about it <clears throat> because what what they have learned then is when i talk about this it makes everybody else uncomfortable so I better stop talking about it. And then they're just, you know, having those feelings anyway, but without the support and the outlets and, you know, having people um, around them who, who see them. And then it festers and then it becomes, you know, uh, possible depression issues or cutting issues or um, idea, idolization of suicide. Um, there's just a whole barrel of stuff that these kids have the potential a higher risk for i'm being i'm trying to be careful here, a higher risk for um because they need to release it it's like a pressure valve right yeah you know it's interesting um it's not like everyone who's has a parent die is going to end up becoming suicidal and have their life destroyed but it is an increased risk and particularly if they end up having pain that doesn't have some other no, outlet isn't the right word, but you know, some way of being supported in their, in their pain. And one of the, you know, one of the people I interviewed, um, Mary Robinson is, is a, she runs a grief center in New Jersey. She was actually a CNN hero uh, for the, who work with children's grief, which is quite interesting because, you know, Anderson Cooper's dad died when he was 10. And so they had quite an interesting, I think he really was interested in, in this work. And she talks about how, um, she says there's no, there's no bad kids. There's just sad kids. No, she, she wasn't a bad kid. She was a sad kid. And she talks about how she feels like if you look around in the adult world and you look in all the, you know, if you look in support groups and 12 step programs and prisons and treatment centers, there's, there's, they're like full of unresolved grief, you know, full of the, the, in general, um, a lot of the people who were there maybe had some kind of unresolved grief or trauma in their childhood, you know, which relates to like ACEs, right? And the, and the idea that the more kind of adverse childhood experiences someone has and, and losing a parent at a young age is, is one of them contributes to problems later. And when I interviewed Vicki J, she runs the, the National Alliance for Grieving Children, which is a terrific organization. So she's like running the group that run that, you know, is the association of all these centers. <clears throat> she said, it's a lot easier to support a grieving child than it is to fix a broken adult later. Amen, amen, yes. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, one of the things that I wondered about, um, you know, how do you know if, you're, if your kid needs grief support, right? And, and one of the things that I've learned from talking to all these people, I, I came up with this idea the grief support is kind of like swimming lessons. Like if you want your kid to be safe around the water, you give them the tools to learn how to swim, to, you know, to, to, to deal with that situation. If you want your kid to figure out how to integrate their, their grief in a healthy way into their life, um, giving them the tools, which often means participating in one of these peer grief groups you know these these programs in every community they have groups for little kids medium-sized kids teenagers young adults parents um and 
you know, and, and there's grief camps that are similar. And they're equipping these kids who have had this tremendous loss with the tools to start integrating their grief in, in healthy ways. And it's quite interesting. You know, it used to be some bunch of years ago, people used to think, well, if you have a loss, you have to kind of like forget it and put it behind you and quote unquote move on, you know, and kind of like bury it and, and move on. That was what people used to think. And now they're realizing that that is actually like not helpful. And that if, you know, if you have a significant loss, it's going to be a part of your story forever. So figuring out how to integrate that into your story in a healthy way, how to, how to remember that person, whether it's something special, um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, you know, if you have a, um, you know, your parent had a, a favorite cookie recipe or something, you can have the, the, in their handwriting, you can have it put on a platter, right? Like there's companies will do that. And then when you make your Christmas cookies every year and you have, you have the platter, you know, mom's platter, grandma's platter, dad's platter, you know, from the recipe and you make the special cookies. And then you're, it's like a healthy way of, of remembering this person and the special role they had in your life. And they can continue to have some kind of role through your memories and through the ways you decide to recognize them going forward. So helping kids to, and to learn some of these things rather than just like stuffing it down and trying to forget it and running away and then having it come out later in some more difficult um, challenge or problem. So let's talk a little bit about, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a plot twist for you, a little bit of a switcheroo. Um, okay. Towards the end for you, did you and your husband have um, conversations as to what his wishes were? Was he able to? really convey that kind of end because that's tough yeah <clears throat> no so that's the interesting thing is he had brain cancer and glioblastoma and glioblastoma affects everybody differently depending on which part of the brain it is in and how, where it's spreading and how aggressive it is and and so in his case it affected him cognitively mm -hmm. and so his short-term memory especially eventually it was kind of all of his memory but his short-term memory was just shot. And so he would never remember like that he had brain cancer or that he wasn't supposed to be going to work tomorrow or that, you know, he just, and so like, even though he was in all the, pardon me, all the doctor's meetings and he heard all the, the diagnosis and the prognosis and the test results and he was part of everything, but he would promptly forget what he had just heard. And so there wasn't really any discussion um there was one time in the eight months that he was sick and this was maybe a third of the way into that eight months um in the first bunch of months were characterized by lots of hospital stays and er visits and at this point he was in the hospital um and my friend had suggested that i try to get him to write cards for the kids like that they could open on their 18th birthdays and their graduations and you know, whatever kind of milestone cards and I thought, oh man, that sounds like a terrible idea. And then I thought, well, she's probably right. It probably is a good idea, but it just sounded awful, right? Like, and especially because he never remembered that he was dying. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Go and say, by the way, you're dying and you need to write these cards? Like that just sounded terrible. So anyway, long story short, one day he was at the hospital and I was home on a weekend morning and he called and he said something about, being confused and he said well I guess that's just the way I am now and there was that little I took it as an opening like a glimmer of having some self-awareness into his situation that he normally didn't have and I thought if I'm ever going to get him to write cards this is the time like this is maybe my only chance so I sent the kids off to friends and I went to the hospital I had to like stop at Target first to buy cards because I didn't even have cards <laughs> go show up at the hospital dreading totally dreading walking in there right I'm like this is gonna be terrible how do I even bring this up I don't remember how exactly I brought it up but I said something about writing cards <clears throat> and he said oh I know what those are those are death and dying notes and I was like huh and so uh, but I was always like checking understanding of stuff right because he would sometimes seem like he understood things we'd go into the doctor and the doctor's like how are you doing and he'd be oh good I played the cross yesterday and I'm like 
where's that coming from? Like, you didn't play lacrosse yesterday. You've never played lacrosse in your life. Like, well, you know, so he says, these are death and dying notes. And so I said, oh, what are those? Checking, right? And he says, oh, it's what you write when you have only a few months left to live and you want to write notes to the people who are important to you. And I was like, wow. Huh. Okay. Right now he gets it. Right. I have no idea how he, how he, in that, why in that moment on that day, he had that amount of clarity because literally the whole eight months, that was the only time. And so to your initial question, you know, did we talk or anything at the end? Um, that was, it was about a third of the way, in, like I said, into his illness. So it was fairly early. Um, that was the only time when we talked, you know, cried, acknowledged to it, each other the situation we were in. And then as quickly as that, you know, lasted for an hour or something, he was back to being confused again and not remembering what was going on. Um, and the, for the remainder of the time, he was never, never had the clarity again to have those kinds of of discussions. I think it's really interesting. I, I was married once and we really never had those discussions either. I don't I don't think I don't think you have the discussions until it's kind of too late. Um, I absolutely recommend now having those discussions and, and making sure because I've learned the hard way. Mm -hmm. um, what kinds of steps do you recommend after this experience and being a mom? to um to work that out with your kids on, on your behalf oh like you mean you talk to your kids about what you're you know when it's time for you to go like you uh, have those conversations no i haven't and and they're still fairly young they're 14 and 16. um my 16 year old might be able to handle it my 14 year old i don't think that would be a good discussion right now i've got the I forget what the names of the documents are. You know, I have a will, of course, but I have a... The living will and know, all that stuff. All that stuff where I've specified, like, you know, I want to be cremated and, you know, and my, my I think my parents are the ones who are, um, you know, in charge or whatever. Because um, I don't have a spouse now to be in charge of those things. <laughs> uh, and so that, you know, is kind of where all that's laid out. Um, and I will say that my husband had mentioned previously maybe randomly like before he was sick at various points over the years had had mentioned being cremated so you know and and it's never like we actually sat down and had a whole discussion like let's talk about our you know in fact i think when he brought it up in the past i think i was probably like let's not talk about that you know <laughs> and it wasn't even like he was trying to have a big discussion i just think he mentioned that a few points wanted to be cremated so i was i was confident you know i didn't have to debate about what to do about that i just said okay cremation like that that decision was made and the interesting thing this is this is kind of creepy um you know when you have to plan the funeral um you have to p pick songs and pick readers and pick all these people and things and what are all these things right well my mom reminded me that a few years previously a family friend's husband had died and they were looking to have a Catholic funeral and the wife was looking for suggestions on songs because she wasn't Catholic, but her husband was. So she's like, I don't know what songs to pick. And so anyway, they ended up asking my husband to suggest songs. And there was this email um, from my husband back to this family friend saying, you know, oh, maybe this song and this song and this song, um, you know, good would be good choices. And then he added... Well, actually, I think the email had gone to me, and then I forwarded it on. So in the email to me, he said, by the way, maybe this is too, I don't know, morose or something, but should anything ever happen to me, these are also songs that I would want. <laughs> and at the time, I was like, okay, no, like, that that's just not, you know, whatever, like, fine, but no, just stop saying that, right? <laughs> and and this, this was a few years before where there was no indication that anything was wrong. And so, and I forgot all about that. Well... When he died, my mom said, hey, remember that email? I think I've still got it. I can re-forward it to you if you want. And you know that might help you with songs. And so then she forwarded it to me and I was like, ah, it was almost like he was speaking from the grave because here's his email and he's writing, oh, by the way, these are the songs I would want. And then he signs off and I'm like, so that part was also easy to, 
I'm like, these are the songs. No, no, we'll just have to spin our wheels about that one. We'll just worry about picking the other stuff. Well, and I, and I, and I love your honesty about it because I think in most relationships, we are dismissive about the idea of dying. We're like, oh no, we don't, we, yeah, ugh. let's let yeah. the devil to the door, right? Let's <laughs> yeah. not have this conversation, but we really need to have that conversation. We really need to um, get serious about it. And, you know, it doesn't have to be long and in depth and, and crying and tissues, but it's a real mm. subject. And I think a lot of people fall short because they don't want to have, it's too scary. Right. It's right. And you don't want to have to make these decisions. And it also doesn't seem urgent. Right. And it's easy to put off something that doesn't seem urgent and it's fine. You can put it off till next week, probably. But when next week becomes next week, next week and 10 years later, right, then maybe you've put it off too long. And, um, you know, there's actually a really good book that I would recommend. I, I interviewed BJ Miller. He's a hospice and palliative care doctor. And he wrote a book called The Beginner's Guide to the End. And it's got a lot of really practical information it's a fairly thick book but it's not it's not hard to read i mean it's and it's chapter by chapter and it's got a, and it's not just for people who think they might be dying sometime soon you know somebody who's on hospice or ill or anything else it's for them yes but it's also for i would say any adult to i think it to facilitate some of these conversations with your spouse or the people you care about or your family members or whoever you know is going to be um involved you know in, in end of life stuff and in fact to be able to say hey i've been reading this book ha 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 we don't want to talk about this but let's talk about it right and kind of use the book as a as an excuse to start the conversation um i think it's i think that's a really good place to get started because nobody does want to talk about it but but it is important inevitably we're all going to die um mm. and you know it we don't know how that hourglass is going to empty and we don't know if it's going to shatter or if it's going to be a slow, slow moving target. We just don't know the, the right. final chapter. Um, but I think we are in a time period not to be afraid of it, to understand it, its reality. And what can we do to prepare ourselves and our family for it? Because all too often I counsel people who are just so stuck in the, but I moment. And yeah. I'm sure you run into that a lot too, because mm. just well, I, I hope that, you know, we've had, we're in this pandemic, we've had what, 600,000 people maybe now in this country die. So grief is more in the forefront of people's minds or in the news or in the national discussion. And, you know, grief and also death and so if if some of these things that are happening maybe maybe um uh, what's the word i'm looking for prompt some people to have some of these discussions because you know it's normally it's pretty easy to ignore death right we go along every day we're busy we're doing stuff and you know maybe occasionally something pops up and you go to somebody's funeral um but it's mostly out of sight out of mind but now for the past year it's 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 terrible but it's all in the national discourse so if that prompts a few more people to think about it and have some of these discussions then you know then then i hope that they do that our hourglass is up my friend and i absolutely adore you how can it be I mean, already i know it goes by so freaking fast <laughs> your podcast probably goes by really fast too it Even does the, the 45 minute to hour long one it seems like seconds. Um, yeah. Beautiful conversation today. You are an amazing woman and an amazing mom and badass all on your own. Well, thank you. Where can we find more information about you? And do you have any last words for today? Yes, yes. Well, um, so my website is jennylisk.com, J-E-N-N-Y-L-I-S-K.com. And you can find the podcast there. Again, it's the Widowed Parent Podcast. Um, so I encourage anybody who's a widowed parent who has babies up through college age kids um, to take a listen to the podcast. A number of other like articles, resources there, resources for people who will want to support their friends, their family, their colleagues, their neighbors who want to understand how to be a better ally. Uh, so I have a 
uh, site jennylisk.com slash allies has all that information. Um, that would be the best place to go. I'm on all the social media platforms at Lisk Jenny, L-I-S-K-J-E-N-N-Y. Um, and as far as a, a parting thought, I guess I would say to people um, that you're really not alone. I hear from a lot of widowed parents. They listen to the show, they write to me, and they don't know anybody in their personal circles, in their kids' school, in their neighborhood, et cetera, who is a younger, you know, a widow with kids who are still at home. Um, any widows they know may be older with grown kids and, and more, maybe more towards the elderly category. Um, but there are a lot of us out there. I didn't realize it until I started getting involved in this. Um, there are a lot of us out there and it's really worth it, I think, to try to find some other people, connect, go to Camp Widow if you can't find anybody in your community. Um, because it, it, it is nice to have people who get it and, um, you know, can be that, that community of support. Yay. And just that person who just gives you a hug because you see them and you hear them and you feel them and yep. that's what you can do, right? Yep. Yep. All right, Miss Jenny, you are beautiful and I'll talk to you soon. Sounds great. Thanks a lot, Rusty. Thanks, honey. You're watching Living and Thriving with Rusty and I get to do this five or six or seven times a day for about eight, nine weeks, and it is beautiful. And I know that it helps you, which gives me love and makes the world a brighter place. And thanks, Jenny, for all your hard work. And definitely check out her links below and reach out to her. I bet you she'll answer your questions. I'm pretty sure. Know that you're loved. Know that you're beautiful. Do something kind for somebody today. It's just like so important because you really can change somebody's life, whether you donate your extra food or those shorts that are too big or too small or you buy somebody a cup of coffee, make a difference that's positive and impactful on your community. You're a better person for it. Till next time.